the Pearl cast. I am here today with, I'm honored to be able to interview Alicia from Alicia, what's the name of, Alicia Plummer from, what's the name of your, uh, okay, we might have to start over. <laughs> I think we should keep this all in because it's real. <laughs> so tell me the name of your Ravelry store because you're a well-known designer and you have a lot of patterns that are fantastic. So what's the name of your Ravelry designer? Yes. Um, so yeah, I design under the name Alicia Plummer, um, but the, the store itself is called Two Little Plums because okay. when I first started designing, um, it was more for my kids right? Um, and in a way to save money and, and pour my love onto my children in a new way. So last name Plummer, Plums. I was trying to hide my identity a little bit because I didn't think I would ever become a published designer. And so I was like, oh, hide the last name. Plums is close enough to Plummer. Right. And now look, and now look, though. <laughs> I mean, you have lots and lots of amazing patterns on Ravelry, and you've been in, I noticed, see, I did a little homework, you've been in some, like, Malabrigo books. Yep. And some other publications that it's... Um, when I first started designing, actually, I used uh, Malabrigo for one of my pieces, and Antonio, the owner, actually reached out to me. And he was so nice and he was so encouraging and he's like, let me send you some yarn. And it's just one of those things that like, you never forget those people that supported you in the very beginning. And you just always think of them so warmly and lovingly, yeah. you know, and um, his support was really a, a huge, a huge push for me to continue designing. Yeah. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, like, I can't believe he's interested in my work. This is amazing. And, you know, I didn't think anybody would ever want to knit my stuff. <laughs> and look now, though, really. Yeah. I, I get what you mean, because when I first started and I first had my 1,000 subscribers, I was like, oh, people are, are watching. There's a few people watching. So, yeah. hey. And, you yeah. know, I think we all, particularly as women, have those confidence issues, and we all, mm -hmm. we all do. And mm -hmm. you have to just kind of take a deep breath and go forth, you know, and just mm -hmm. and do it and do what you enjoy doing. Yeah. And of course there's always naysayers and there's people that, you know, hit the thumbs down button on your video or decide that they don't care for your pattern or whatever, but you're like, okay, you do you. It's the internet. There's lots of options out there. You go ahead. <laughs> right. Yes. I, I think definitely like society tells us as women, we have to really fit a certain mold and look a certain way. And like, we're starting to really break out of that. Yeah. But it's taking a while, you know, and I think I definitely fell into that mind trap of like, you have to be a nice girl and everyone has to love everything that you do for you to be successful. Right. And I remember one of the first times that I got some really harsh criticism on um, the Ease sweater, which was one of my first, um, my first bigger designs. And I had somebody write me a pretty angry message regarding something about the pattern. And I just sat there sobbing because I was just, I was so heartbroken. And, you know, someone said to me, you know, you've really got to develop a, a tougher skin. And, um, you know, you, you continue in the industry, you grow a lot and you learn that like sometimes people are just frustrated and that comes across differently yeah. than maybe they intended to, right. um, right. you know, and I, I'm kind of learning like it's, it's okay if not everybody likes me personally or loves my work like that's why Ravelry is so amazing there's such a an incredible and diverse group of people right and they all bring so much beauty and integrity to the table it's it's great and people are super helpful I, I think mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so tell me I mean I know you started designing a while ago but how did you learn to knit as a child um, yeah, I, mean, I feel like that's the obligatory question. How did you learn to knit? <laughs> no, I, I love this question um, because it, it has also like a lot of meaning for me and I will get into a little more like how emotional of a person I am or, yeah. you know, I'm in type two e, um, Enneagram kind of thing. Just like I'm really people -y and I love people. Um, so I learned the basic knit stitch from my grandmother who was one of the most incredible women that has ever walked the face of this earth. She was one of the first female principals in the state of Massachusetts. She um, had a husband and she was working as um, an occupational therapist in World War II um, over in California and she was pregnant and he passed away. So she had to travel back across the country pregnant and alone, come home 
Um, she, you know, after doing the teaching thing and having my father and my two aunts, she ended up um, running her own antiques business out of her barn here in town for a while. She just, she did a lot of amazing things and she taught me everything I know about money. She taught me how to fix things. She was always repairing things herself. She was yeah. so intellectually sharp. She was a feminist. She was amazing. Um, well, and she had to do all that on her own, it sounded like, and she wrote, she figured it out. She did. And her attitude of, of grit of, you know, if you work hard enough, you can achieve something. If you're willing to put enough time and enough effort in, it's not necessarily about natural skill or talent. It's about how hard are you willing to work? Right. And, and, and she really taught me that. Fortitude. Yes. So she sat me down and she taught me the basic knit stitch um, and kind of the basic pearl stitch. She didn't teach me how to cast off or anything because we never got that far. So I used to just run a piece of string through the live loops and kind of tie off both ends. <laughs> I'm done. And, and that was my base in knitting. Um, I didn't come back to it again until I had had my older daughter and she was around a year and a half old and my mother's a quilter. And I sew a little bit too, but she makes amazing quilts. Um, and she had visited her best friend's mother, who was a knitter, and they, they had taken her to a yarn shop. And so she showed up at my door after this trip, and she said, Alicia, you can knit, right? I bought you this baby sweater pattern and this yarn here. And I was like, oh, okay. And, <laughs> and, and it was a pattern. I had never read a pattern in my life, didn't know any of this stuff. Um, but luckily for me, Google and YouTube existed. Right. You know, right. This, this is around 2009, 2010. And so everything that I didn't know, I just kind of attacked and did like a kind of self teaching from all the amazing people on YouTube and on Ravelry who were willing to support that education and yeah. share their knowledge for free, which is another thing that I think is so amazing about the knitting industry. Right. Like Absolutely. Paying for patterns and instruction is definitely worth it. These people are making a living this way. This is the only way I support myself. But there's also the people that put up, you know, cast on tutorials for free right. and, and things like that. And I can't imagine where we would all be if those people weren't there too. Right, we're doing a knit along. And while this is a paid yeah. pattern, obviously, and that's what you need to do is go buy the pattern. Links are, the, all the <laughs> links are always down below. You guys know this. So the viewers know. But the thing about that is, is, you know, if people have questions, even though it's a paid pattern, I'm going to be doing tutorials about the techniques specifically, like, here's how you're going to make a yarn over. And most people know how to do that. But do you know how to fix it if you skip one and you need to drop down and like create one after the fact without thinking all the way back or yeah. ripping and removing your needles and actually tearing back. So there's yeah. some things that you can do to, to fix that if you want to, or maybe because you want to maintain the tension, maybe you do tink back, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And when I learned to knit, yeah, there wasn't YouTube. There wasn't, dare I say, there was not email. <laughs> <laughs> there was no internet. And so it was local yarn shops, knitting circles, your grandmother, my, you know, my grandmother did not knit, she crocheted. My other yeah. grandmother, the, my other grandmother did knit, however. But, you know, pretty cursory things. I think she did a few uh, sweaters. Yeah. Uh, but right, that's how people learn though, was from each other or from an aunt or a friend or a niche, a yarn store, you know, a craft circle or whatever you knit. You learn from your local community in person. And yeah. now the internet has just made it so we can have a giant community. Like I've never been to Maine and there you are. And here I am in Wyoming and yeah. you can visit. How fantastic, right? Yeah. So when did you begin like, so you started knitting when your oldest was a toddler, but when did yeah. you realize, hey, I could create my own things. I could like design a whole sweater. Cause to me, that's daunting. I've tried to write some <laughs> sock patterns and I'm like, I know what I'm doing, but actually putting what's here on paper and then having it make sense and translating that to written instructions, mm -hmm. it's hard. So it's really funny because I can actually kind of tie this into my literature background a little bit and I'll explain in a sec. So I have um, a degree in education and literature so I can teach K through eight. Um, and I'm very passionate about literature and different voices, um, particularly post-colonial literature is my absolute favorite. The stories are just so rich and vibrant and amazing. 
Um, but anyways, after I read a book, mm-hmm. I kind of get the author's voice stuck in my head. Yeah. yeah. So I'll walk around and my thoughts will sound like the author's right. writing style from the book. And so this happens to me really easily. If I'm hanging out with somebody who has an accent, I will pick it up while we're talking. I'm just one of those people. And so reading knitting patterns, the language ended up just kind of going into my head. And I'd be walking around making dinner and I'd be like, oh, CO2, P3, and sure. don't ask me why. But um, I found but that it's living... Immersion, that's how people learn Spanish. Yeah. It's that immersion. Yeah. If, if you don't know how to do it, if, if you're, you know, tentative about doing this cardigan, jump in and join us. Yeah. Um, and we can help each other and walk together along the way. I think, I think diving in is great. And I think mistakes are inevitable sure. and beautiful it's because fine. we're not perfect. None of us are perfect. I'm certainly nowhere near perfect. I showed Jenna earlier. This is all clean. <laughs> uh, I showed her the other side of my room. <laughs> and like dead plants. <laughs> like I literally just took all, I took all the stuff and I just yeah exactly just whoosh, we'll, we'll we'll deal with it later so um so that language kind of worked its way into my brain and i live in um kind of like a more rural area of maine not as rural as where you are but <laughs> you know like the closest city is an hour away and and you know we do i'm really outdoorsy um i don't get a chance to dress up a whole ton so the pieces that i need to wear are a little bit on the simpler side and then i was homeschooling my kids and you know, running my home and, you know, taking them to sports, you know, eventually and doing all that stuff. I need something that I can knit that has like enough detail that it's interesting, but also is simple enough that my brain can pretty much go on autopilot a lot too at the end of the night because nighttime is when I knit. Right. Or I try to knit during the day. It just doesn't happen as much as I'd like it to. Um, so I just started kind of writing my own patterns that would fit my style because I'm kind of plain. And pretty simple, a little bit classic, but easy to just throw on and go. Yeah. So Melissa Shaswari out in Wisconsin, she's Dandelion Girl on Ravelry. She's her designs are very similar to mine, um, in that they're simple and and beautiful with a little bit of detail. But she has more of a, I would say like more of a romantic lean. So she's more like lace and like beautiful cables. She's just she has a more romantic touch. And we actually co-authored a book together, um, Plum Dandy Knits, eventually. But our friendship started on Ravelry when I knit something of hers and saw she had a daughter a similar age to me, to mine. And, um, she encouraged me to design and she's like, you can totally do this, like do it. And so I would call her up and be like, do you think I should use K1P1 or, or K3P3 here? And so we would discuss like, you know, asymmetry and visual balance and all kinds of stuff. And we kind of fed off each other. That's um, amazing. That's so cool. Right. Yeah. But again, the knitting community, people are very giving and very warm and, and shout out to her. But, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it's about is people sharing. I was talking to one of my sisters about, you know, just topics for videos and things and, and linking to other people's work. And the internet is a giant place. There is room for everyone. There really is. And there doesn't need to be any competition about anything. There's plenty of room for everyone to be successful and for us to enjoy everybody's content. That's, it's fantastic. Yeah. So the sweater that you're wearing, I recognize. Yes. And I'm going to be embarrassed if I'm wrong, but that's <laughs> the, is that the campsite drop? It is. Yeah. That was so, right. <laughs> so this one has the, the drop shoulder and it's got some fun elements that the other campsites don't, um, that are a little more advanced. Like there's some short row shaping thrown in here so that it follows the natural curvature a little bit better and it helps this drape. Um, And I just, I did this one last summer and I really, um, I love the color on this one. It's um, all my campsites are in Julia Salen yarn because Julie yarn supported me for the very first campsite shawl that was ever done. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm very loyal. Um, And so ever since then, all my campsites have been in her live through DK, which is a, it's a wool and silk blend that has incredible drape and her colors are just amazing. Um, if you want to see a skein, I'm working on a new campsite right now, and I have an obsession oh. with with blues. And this one's called um, I'm gonna butcher this. So for my French speaking friends, I'm sorry. Après la pluie, which means after the rain. No. Um, I'm a sucker for a good slate grayish blue. And um, so this this color just reminds me of the sun faded pine needles. 
at my camp um, in the middle of the summer, the, the pines just shed a ton of needles and a ton of pollen. And I, the smell is incredible. It's so good. Um, so when I saw this orange, I was like, oh, I need an orange campsite. Talking about the campsite series, there's, yeah. there's a couple different sweaters. There's the cardigan. There's two shawls, the campsite wrap and then the campsite shawl. Yes. So and the third one coming out this summer with a new construction that I'm working on. Cool. I think you yeah. were knitting that the other night when we were visiting. So we'll definitely watch for that. One thing I'm going to put down below real quick across the bottom of the screen is until May 20th or through May 20th, you can use the code lowercase Jana25 to get 25% off any of Alicia's campsite patterns. Honestly, it's a really relaxing pattern to knit. Yeah. The eyelids are just so breezy and it doesn't use as much yarn as a typical sweater. It's just, okay. it's very soothing. And I feel like right now, like a lot of people could use some soothing. Yeah. Oh, here's another idea that I had. I was looking, I was thinking about this this morning. I looked at the campsite wrap, which I really enjoyed the long rectangle. I feel yeah. like that would be a really good TV netting. Like you said, very soothing and meditative, very relaxing. Yeah. And I just think I want to maybe do a gradient across. That would be beautiful. I think so. Um, I just had, I've seen some campsites that have been faded and they're absolutely gorgeous. It's that, that one's really easy to modify too because it's a rectangle and the chart portions are based on inches. Okay. So it's like work this chart for this many inches, work this chart for this many inches. Oh, sure, you so can absolutely you can add that. Swap like a certain percentage of inches off oh, of each add. portion if you wanted something shorter because that one is... Um, or I would add, just because I like, I want to blank it and I would make it, I'd probably make it wider too because you could add chart repeats to make it wider. So it sounds like it's very customized. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there will eventually be a blanket. Nice. <laughs> Maybe I'll wait for that. You can just wear the blanket. Or I can just do them all. Just gonna roll it up and like. Tell me about the inspiration for the Campside series. Yes. Okay. Um, so as some of you know, I'm more of an emotional designer. So some designers will design based on like aesthetic or, um, Bristol Ivy, who's like an, a really, really close friend of mine, is also a designer, and I, I just love Bristol and respect her so much. She's amazing. And Bristol will see a piece of architecture, you know, or um, like she has an entire book that is based off of origami construction, which is completely amazing. Um, my friend Bea Coleman, Baby Cocktail Knit down in Massachusetts, she um, designs a ton with cables and really goes for like visually pleasing aesthetics and um, I am a super emotional person. I've been told a lot of times in my life that I'm too much or too emotional. And um, like my Myers-Briggs is ENFJ, which is really outgoing. I love people. And I'm learning to really embrace that and, you know, that, that it's a good thing. And I've kind of poured that into my design work. So most of my designs are based on experiences or moments or memories or feelings. Right. And I think a lot of them are pretty universal. So I think it's, um, it's something that people can connect with when they're knitting too. Oh, it's because, relatable, sure. Yeah, you know, if, you, if you're going through something in your life and you're knitting a certain piece, mm -hmm. that piece almost retains some of mm -hmm. that experience. Sure. You know what I mean? So, for example, like the In Stillness cardigan um, that I released this winter, you know, I knit it and photographed it out in Vermont while visiting my family and my aunt's farm. And so, that sweater to me is a big red barn and a thick snowfall and cross country skiing yeah. and um, huge meals made from scratch out of the ground, you know? So it, it, yeah. it the pieces kind of retain these oh, moments of feeling. Um, and when I'm writing my patterns, you know, that happens too. So I had a camp and in Maine, we call it a camp. It's not like a, it's not, um, it's not like a summer camp that you send kids to camp is basically another word for a cabin. Okay. And we're in Maine, so most camps are not super, um, like, oceanfront cottagey, like what you're thinking. These are more like log cabins in the woods right. with, like, that they're seasonal. They're usually only in the summertime, but if you've got a, a year-round camp, well, that's awesome, too. Right. Um, and so I had a family cabin, and it was um, three-bedroom. It was made completely out of cedar. And I spent every single summer in that cabin. My grandmother um, not only took some blueprints and modified something and designed it. Um, 
but she helped build it too. She, you know, helped hand build the stairs that are in it and stuff like that. Cause they're, you know, two by four is kind of yeah. nailed to the walls and stuff. But, um, that place, it just, I lived there in college when I wasn't in, in school, I lived there. My father said, you can live here in the summers. This is going to be yours eventually. And it was just, it's the most amazing place. And it has, you know, the open rafter ceiling. Yeah. Um, and it just, oh, it smelled so good. And my father passed in. Warm, huh? cedar, warm cedar in the summer. Yeah. That smell of warm cedar. Yeah. And oak leaves from outside, too. Just, it is such a sweet, sweet, woody smell. It's great. Um, it was right across the road from the water, so I'd always swim. And my father passed in 2007, and I had spent every single summer there with him um, up until that point. And then kind of a little bit into my marriage, um, my ex-husband really felt like we should sell it because we weren't spending any time there. And the neighborhood was getting a lot louder. There was a lot of drunken four-wheelers at 3 a.m. kind of stuff. It was just, it was this kind of, I don't know how to put but it. Same. It sounds like it was an entirely different energy than ever before. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there was always people that would go down to the beach here and there and set off fireworks a couple times a summer. But it, it really, that neighborhood kind of ramped up a lot. Um, and so there was kind of some pressure on me to sell it. And so I eventually, because we weren't really staying there, um, the pressure was to sell it and find a quieter place. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of convinced myself, like, look, it's, it's just a building. Yeah. Um, I had a really hard time selling it. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't regret it. Mm -hmm. on some degree but I was really heartbroken over it um I cried through I held it together for the signing and then kind of lost it after I walked out the door which I don't mind admitting because again That's super emotional hard. person embracing my emotions um and the way that I I took that sadness and I poured it into the campsite design and so what you get when you're looking at the campsite is you have a um kind of a graduation of eyelets and those eyelets represent raindrops and tears and oh. uh, so one of my favorite memories at the camp would be laying in bed at night, listening to the storms come through. Um, and, and they would start off really soft, you know, and get louder and louder and heavier and harder on the roof. And I just always found it the safest, most calming feeling laying there listening to that. And so I worked it into the shawl to kind of to get it out of me a little bit. And um, you can also see here. So the other sound that goes with the camp. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you're, right. you're lucky I'm not crying right now. <laughs> well, I mean, I thought I had read. I thought I'd done my homework, but I didn't know about that part. I'm like, <sighs> Yeah. Um, my dad was amazing. He was absolutely amazing. And um, I'm I'll, treasure now. <laughs> I'll treasure those moments forever. So the other noise um, that would come into the picture that I didn't write about, but I might eventually do a Morse code based series of patterns. My dad was a huge ham radio operator. Um, I actually have a ham radio tower on my property um, that is still running. It's called a repeater. And yeah, I'm sitting sure. right now for my ham license, and I'm eventually going to try to get his old call sign for any of you out there who are ham radio enthusiasts. Um, this is an old vintage 1950s Helicrafter, and my father's best friend, Brian, um, gave it to me while I'm studying. I can't transmit on it legally, yeah. um, but what I can do is I can kind of listen to the frequencies, and um, I can turn it on. That's so cool. And, um, and you can knit while you're listening to other people's conversations. <laughs> yes, yes. If I if I can find one, it's you know it's it's there's different bands. Sure. And you get like a lot of. You get a lot of the AM radio static. Anyways, um, he used to listen and have conversations late at night, and sometimes just listen to the Morse code. And I would fall asleep listening to the storm and the ham radio in the other room because it was like I said, open rafter ceiling. Yeah. Um, and those feelings just, you know, I was a little girl with her daddy and I felt safe and, and loved and, um, in a magical place that smelled like cedar and oak. <laughs> so it was, I will treasure those memories, even though that camp is gone, I have a different camp, um, in a quieter area 
and um, and that has been very healing and wonderful for me too. And so I'll show you guys a picture of my dad, just so you can see what a handsome guy he was. Oh. And he had flaming red hair. So if you guys remember some of my pattern pictures from earlier, um, I dyed my hair red in his honor on my 30th birthday for a while, but found it was a lot of upkeep. So I just... Well, but you have that coloring for sure. I mean, you yeah. have... Yeah. 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 Sunburns are us. SPF 50 or higher. <laughs> um, oh, all right. Yeah. I'm going to have to gather myself here. <laughs> I feel like well, I need to... I you didn't warn me I needed a tissue box. I needed a tissue box. You said you were emotional, but I'm like, I didn't feel like I need to blow my nose. <laughs> well, I've, ha I've had, honestly, some people message me and write me and tell me that they actually knit the campsite through the passing of their parents. Um, and it has made me feel so incredible that that could be something that is it's cathartic healing to them in in that moment too because of the simplicity of the pattern and and just the elements and the emotion that i put into it it it's really amazing that we can kind of universally share these experiences too and, um, and what i will say is that you know like i'm not in that place at the moment right now thankfully like both mm -hmm. of my parents are living and um but I appreciate knowing your story and what goes into that and that there's so much meaning and, and energy behind that. I definitely appreciate that. I'm looking forward to knitting it for my own reasons, which is this is a time right now where I just want to sit on the couch with my kids and I want to watch a movie maybe and I want to knit something that I've, I've never knitted myself a cardigan, okay? I've knitted, I haven't, I know. I, well, like the one we did last, no, two summers ago that we did on the channel, the Harvest, uh, the Harvest Cardigan from Tin yeah. Ken Knits, I yeah. knitted that, I knitted it for my sister who lives in a different state and I, she measured herself and I made yeah. it for her and I sent it to her and mm -hmm. I've been wanting to do this for a long time and because of the current state of things, you know, a lot of us are home and I wanted something that's not terribly complicated that I can sit with my family and watch them play a game or I can play a board game and knit a few stitches and know where I am. Yes, you know? it's, it's, it's definitely um, it's something that I think is going to be really easy for you to teach all the, the watchers and all our knitting friends um, how to read your stitches. Right, right. So that you know exactly where you are. And, and honestly, like the eyelet rows are so satisfying because you're just like, whoop, and then you slide them together and then you keep yeah. going. But you've got all this fabulous stockinette in between as well. Right. So it's like brains on autopilot. Okay, time to get off autopilot. And so it's I really do. I can do this while I'm with my family. And I it's not I have a couple other things on the needles that are very complicated that I can't yeah. do. I can't watch TV. I can't have anybody talk to me. So yeah. I I need a distraction from that. I need a brain break from the really hard stuff that I other things I'm doing. <laughs> so for me, this is really good timing to know that yeah. to know your story and that emotional connection to it, but also yeah. because my connection to it can be, this is what I'm making during this weird time. Mm -hmm. And this is the connection I have to the people that I love in my family that I'm going to sit with while I make this yeah. it's easy enough. I can do it while I'm with others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. So let me, can I, are you ready for me to ask you some questions about the pattern itself? Yes, but I'll show you my grandmother really quickly just because I feel like she deserves yeah. So this is her actually inside the cabin, um, and that's the stairs that she put in. That's and awesome. there's actually, there was a little bed hidden right under here, so it's very cozy. And then that's her and me and my mother, too, when we were. Oh! Really? So many years ago. But I just, I came across those, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to share, because, like, I don't know, I just, I love sharing little. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. She would, she would be proud. You know she would be. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I'm sure. I mean, if nothing else, just of my grit, because I feel like yeah. I work really hard. Um, you know, up until this past year, I was homeschooling, you know, for most of my day, two different right. grades, full time, all right. the subjects. And then we would go off to sports and I would manage the travel soccer team. Right. And all the hockey things. Team. Um, and then we had a little bit of dance classes on the side too. And then I would come home, make dinner, and then I would go in from like eight to midnight and I would knit and answer emails and stuff. So, um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm diving in full time a little more now, but now that school's out because of COVID, it's kind of like I'm thrown back into like how it was before. It's kind of yeah. like a full time job on, on part time hours. Right. Right. Which I honestly really like. I, I thrive under a little bit of pressure, so it's been good. But yes, I'm, I've got the pattern pulled up. I am, I'm ready to go. Well, and I'm sure that these are going to be really, be <laughs> <laughs> really cursory questions that are not, you know. I mean, you'll know. Yeah. But I've started. I started going through things. What I want to do first is tell people, swatch. <laughs> Because here's the thing, people mm -hmm. think that a swatch, and I'm going to do a whole video later this weekend, I'll record it and edit it this weekend, mm -hmm. about, for this knit along, about swatching and why it's important. So you're going to, and I know this is not a super difficult pattern, but you're going to spend a lot of hours, many people have been already invested a lot of money in yarn, so you yeah. have a big investment in terms of yarn and time, so honor that by making sure it's going to fit yourself or whoever you're making it for so mm -hmm. you need to honor that and honor the process so having said that i'm going to do a video about swatching and how i'm going to swatch and why it's important but a swatch should be a cutout of what you're actually making so this whole thing about garter stitch edging and knit four inches in the middle it's really kind of nonsense because garter stitch edging distorts the stitches inside i'll go through all that my question for you however yeah when you say in the pattern that this the gauge is 18 stitches for four inches, yeah, does that does that take into consideration the eyelets and the yarn overs, or no. are you just talking about the stockinette? I'm here? talking about the stockinette here. So okay. one of the cool things about the cardigan, um, and one of the things about the way that I would say a good amount of women are built, including myself, is that we have some hips going, um, and so with the eyelets. The fabric, and I can actually kind of demonstrate here, the fabric still stays pretty much where it's supposed to, right. but you can see that at the bottom, there's a little bit more give, okay? Yeah. So it's still like, there's still the same amount of stitches going down that sure. gauge area, but there's definitely more like, there's more fluidity, there's more movement, there's a little bit more width um, that happens because of the openness. And I feel like that works really well because, you know, our hips naturally go out a little bit. So the swatch is for the Just main part where the, where the structure of the cardigan happens. And the structure is mostly happening up here, you know, because that's where we need the fit to be right. um, the firmest and, and the most right. precise. But I'll tell you why I'm going to do a larger swatch that will incorporate some of the eyelet pattern. Here's mm -hmm. why I'm going to do that and in my demonstrations is because everybody's knitting with different needles and different yarn. So yeah. I want to make sure that the resulting fabric is how I want it to be, yeah. how I want the drape to be, how I want the look to be, how I want the elasticity to be. Yeah. So I'm going to knit a larger, I don't do the little four inch, four inch thing. I'm going to knit like a yeah. six to eight inch block, including yeah. um, a, a succession for lack, I don't know what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. of those eyelets because I want to yeah. see what it's going to be like and then I'm going to keep that so that's why I've ordered an extra skein for swatching yeah. yeah because what if the yarn that I have and the needles that I've chosen they don't play well together or what if it's fabulous but I won't know that I want to know that before I begin the whole entire thing and invest everything yeah because I'll say right I think I mean this might be me because I love I love me some stockinette but I feel like all yarn looks good in stockinette, but not necessarily all yarn looks good in cables or full of yarn overs. And yeah, so great. incorporating that into your swatch, you're going to know exactly what's going to happen. Exact. Yeah. I don't want surprise when I'm, when I'm like halfway down the body and then I'm like, Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And make sure you are blocking those swatches the way you are going to block your finished piece. Right. Don't just blast it with an iron if you're going to wet block later, because again, totally different result. Yeah. Yeah. I always, I wet block everything just yeah. because I, I don't know. That's how my mother taught me. <laughs> I, I just started wet blocking. I mean, stuff's going to get washed eventually. And I used to love the hiss of the steam iron, you know, it's just very satisfying. It's like, and then and you know, the going like, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> um, but I wet blocked this for the first time just two weeks ago. Cause I was wet blocking something else. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to throw that in there because I don't really like how bunchy the bottom rib is and it really just made this come alive as far as 
drape, the softness um, that I did not know. And the yarn blooms. Life. When you give it a good soak, the yarn blooms. It, it like. Does. I've always loved it, but man, it's so much oh. better than I ever thought it could be. Guys, get your knits wet. Try it out. Yes. And, uh, I use soak wash. I've also used a twig and horn wash. I've also just used a dollop of hair conditioner in a sink of lukewarm water if you don't have, you know, the other stuff. I just use one little drop of like Dawn dish soap or nothing at all. If I'm worried about it having a bunch of oils for my hand, if I'm knitting the summertime and it's warm yeah. and I'm concerned mm -hmm. about just how much I've handled it or there's been a lot of frogging and re-knitting and, yeah, yeah. you know, I might use a tiny bit of some kind of detergent, but you get yourself some wool washer, Eucalyn, or yeah, Euclid, I don't know how you pronounce that. Whatever. I don't know how to pronounce that either. You know what I mean. Google wool nope. wash. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good to know. So I'm going to do a whole video for early next week, probably Tuesday, uh, about my reasons for swatching the way you'll see mm -hmm. me do it. Mm -hmm. So okay, so that's one question. Okay, speaking of swatching though, so it's a cardigan. So we're knitting. Mm -hmm across purling back. Yes. So I'm gonna do that with my swatch. However, I am also going to swatch in the round because the, the sleeves same. are knitted in round. Yeah. Now, yeah. you're gonna say, well, that's too much work. People bitch and whine all the time about swatch. Come on, people. You want to do this right. This is an heirloom quality piece, and if you do it correctly, it will last for decades. Yeah, well, so and I would say too, tight. like, a Go lot ahead. of people knit tighter in the round than they do flat. Um, well, and yeah. you might be one of those people that has a really eclectic, um, variety of needles and some are metal and some are wood. You will get different gauges on the same size wood and metal needles or plastic. Um, yep. so yes, that's okay. also something to take oh, into yeah. consideration. Okay. So in the video, I'm going to show you, you don't have to knit a half a sleeve to swatch. I'll show you how to speed swatch in the video. So watch for that. But as far as the mechanics of making the stitch, the other reason that it's different when you swatch in the round or when you go back and forth is the act of bringing that yarn forward to purl adds extra material to that stitch. And you don't get that when you knit in the round. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. it's also good to know. It's just good to, okay, we'll get to the swatching. <laughs> I could just go on, but we won't. <laughs> okay, so I'm looking down because I'm looking at my list because I don't want to forget things. Now, here's another thing talking about needles. I'm glad you brought this up. In the pattern, it says to size eight is just the recommended needle. But again, I'm going to tell people you need to swatch because a size eight with the yarn I'm going to use, and oh my gosh, I'm going to show it to you. Let me find it here. Did I tell you about this, Alicia? Mm -hmm. Okay. The yarn I'm using is called Earth Yarns. Oh, that's pretty. It's lovely. That's and I'm going to alternate my skeins so I don't yeah. have weird pooling. I'll alternate my skeins. That's going to be part of the video tutorial because a lot of people have, several people have ordered this yarn through my affiliate link. Yay. Thank you very much. So what was the point? <laughs> um, alternating skeins. Yes. Oh. Because look, no, oh. look, you can see. Yeah. Can you see that little carry there? Apparently yeah. there's a new method. Um, it's called helical knitting. Yeah. Yeah, I've read about the twist there, but yes, this is um this is alternated skeins, and you can see why too, because if you look really closely, it's you tonal. can see like little dark, yeah, you can see little dark runs. Right. And it's, it's you don't want those all. I mean, maybe you do if you're one of the, but you might get like a really clear line, which is yeah. What if you get a big far. blotch that looks like you spilled something? Right. Yeah. I don't. I don't want that. Okay, but the I know what my point was. All right. So the pattern mm -hmm. recommends size eight needles. That's a medium size. Yeah. So there's three needle sizes, six, eight, and nine. But, but if I swatch with this and I'm not getting the gauge, I'm going to need to adjust that because I'm an individual. Everybody knits differently. My style's different, whether you throw or continental or whatever. Yep. So you need to make sure that you're using whatever. So let's say, for example, that I tend to be a loose knitter, which isn't necessarily true, but it's just a hypothetical example. Yeah. Yeah. And let's say a size seven is my medium size needle. Yeah. So would I, just would I adjust accordingly? So would the small size be a five then instead of a six? Yeah. And then would the large be an eight? Yeah. So there needs to be two new needle sizes. These are US sizes. So I apologize for my international. Yeah. Um, six is a 4.0, seven is a. Four and a half. 
yeah. 4.5. What is 8? 8 is, is a it, 5. Eight's oh, 8 five. is a 5. Okay, I didn't know if it was a 5 or a 4.75. But the interval needs to be the same is what I'm saying. So yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if I'm getting gauged with a size, U.S. size 7 or a 4.5 millimeter, mm -hmm. then I would go down to a 5. Yeah, it just gives you a cleaner, firmer ribbing. Okay. Um, okay. It's something when I did a publication piece for um, Brooklyn Tweed mm -hmm. a while back, um, one of the things they said is Jared really likes you to go down two needle sizes because it just creates much of a cleaner rib. And I found that. And so some of my patterns, I don't do that. It just depends on the yarn and how it's behaving. Right. But, you know, some patterns I've gone down three or four needle sizes for my rib um, to, but get, to get a clean edge. If, if a knitter doesn't want it drawn in quite that much, go down one needle size. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Like this, if this is your sweater, you don't, you know, the, I think it's easy to get caught up sometimes in like the rules of a pattern, but like, right. this is your piece. Like you can break those rules. If you want yeah. if you want three quarter length sleeves, if you want short sleeves, you want more front ribbing, like we can do those things. And I want to tell you, I am happy you went with the knit two pearl to a two by two rib because I hate one by one. <laughs> I don't like it. Oh, I love I love the way it looks, but it's it's definitely I don't like knitting it sometimes. It's tedious. So it's I'm happy. Cool. Yeah, I go back and forth and back and forth. So yeah, I'm, really yeah, yeah. Glad, I'm glad this is two by two because that's what I do with like all my socks, and so it's like autopilot two by two. And if I have a variation from that, I have to really think about it because two by two is so automatic for me. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I mean, also, hey, it's it's easy enough to modify into two by two. You just need that multiple there and. I want to ask you one more question real quick about the pattern itself. Yes. Do you have a suggestion for a bind off method, a, a stretchy bind off, a looser bind off method? What do you, what do you use for your bind off? Um, it depends on what part of the body I'm working. Okay. So like if it's a neckline or um, like, well, if it was a pullover neckline, mm -hmm. um, I really like, the Elizabeth Zimmerman's sewn bind off. Yes. Um, which right. creates a nice clean edge. And I'll do that on sleeves as well. But if you're doing that around like the bottom of a sweater, that's a lot of it, yarn to be threading it out of a hole. So um, Jenny's super stretchy bind off is one yeah, that I like. I like that one too. Um, I use that for I, socks. Yeah. I just learned the Icelandic bind off, um, which works well on shawls. So for this one, I actually just went up. Um, I just went up a like maybe two needle sizes and did a regular bind off okay on this one okay um but you just have to like you have to experiment and then kind of stop and like look mm -hmm. and and say like okay is this um is it pulling in or is it fine right yeah. yeah so like up and around this part i like to use a rigid bind off with a, a needle size bigger because you don't want that front neckline edge to be stretching out too much Okay. Because it's gonna it's gonna affect it coming back off the shoulders and the hang a little bit more. Right. Whereas around like the bottom hem, like right here, you might be able to get away with a stretchy bind off because you might want to pull it tight like across your butt when you're doing like this with your cardigan, you know, and kind of right. closing it around yourself. So right. a stretch there is good, but a stretch around here I typically don't like. But that's so that's personal say, preference. When you say the rigid bind off, you just mean the thing where regular, regular, I, I yeah. regular where you're just knitting, you're just lifting it's that better. loop over the next one and carrying yeah. on. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I just call it rigid because it is. Oh, rigid. it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It totally makes yeah. sense. I'm excited. Oh, you popped into our Ravelry group. So Alicia's been lurking a little bit in our groups. Yeah. I felt like we'd been visited by a celebrity. Oh my gosh, but I'm not like you guys. No, I was excited. I'm like, oh, she popped in. Yay. <laughs> well, of course, I feel like, and like you and I talked a little bit about this, like they're not you guys aren't just customers, you're friends, like you're people. And, and so I want to know the people that are knitting my patterns. I want to know how my patterns make them feel. Like when somebody finishes like an ease or a campsite, those are you, like my, my two big, really big sellers, um, probably in stillness too, but they're just like, this is my favorite sweater. It makes me feel so good when I'm wearing it. Like I look so good in it. And like, that makes me feel so good because I can make somebody feel better about themselves without even ever meeting them. Well, you know, that's why I, I, yeah, that's why I chose this pattern. Several of the people on our patron group had said, oh, I have this in my queue. I've been wanting to knit this for a long time. Yeah. And I wasn't really familiar with it until a few months ago. And then I'm like, oh, you know, and I'm not a small person. So I want something that's really simple. That's, I can just, it's going to become my favorite three season 
everyday Mr. Rogers kind of sweater, like where you're yeah. going on every day. Yeah. So, and I mean, like this one is, you know, this one's sized up to like a 63 inch bust. And that's um, it the reason you could it. go a little bit higher if you totally. wanted to. Yeah, totally yeah. inclusive because not all of us are tiny. Yeah. And um, so my tech editor and I have actually been going back over some of my older patterns and um, resizing them to make them more inclusive. And honestly, like a lot of that was just that when I was a newer designer, the math was a lot. It's simpler than I thought it was. Honestly, right. it really but is. Didn't I didn't know. know if you could make wider underarms. I didn't know about short rows and like just different tricks that you can do to get a better fit. And the way I felt was like, if I'm going to offer this in like a 64 inch bust and my back neckline cast on is like 15 inches wide, that's not fair to the person who's knitting it because they're going to end up honestly, excuse my language with a piece of crap sweater that doesn't fit well. And that's not fair to anybody. Um, so as that's I got better, do yeah, that's huh? not why you're doing this. You're, not, you're doing it so that people, sorry, I was talking over you. No, you no, no, no. People, you're, people are going to end up with a, a crap sweater, but that's, and that's, as you as a designer, that's not why you're doing this. It's quite the opposite. You want yeah. people to love it. And that's yeah, where you're exactly. Right. Yeah, no, when I said you're censoring me, I was cracking a joke about using the word crap. Oh, no, I have a potty mouth. Yeah. Everyone knows that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're going back over a lot of the older patterns. So, like, you'll see patterns like um, Ease and then the campsites have a much more inclusive range of sizing. I'm re-releasing the Edgar Town light pullover um, tonight, actually, which is, it's a nice v-neck. It's mostly stockinette. It's got some great drape with a little detail at the bottom with a cute split hem. And um, that's going to be offered up to a 67 inch bust. Mm -hmm. And so um, the next sweater that's probably going to get sized up is called Seclude. And that's also another V-neck. Um, and we're, I'm going to, we're going to keep going. Like I, I would eventually like to get my entire library redone as far yeah. as numbers go. It's great. Um, and I can also fix things that, you know, when I very first started designing weren't so great. So for example, the Wyatt sweater is, it's a cardigan and it's something I'm going to resize and re-release this summer. Even for my size, the back neck is quite generous, which makes it um, slip off a little bit. And so oh. I'm going to rewrite it um, to fix those things because I think they should be fixed. And there's other ways we can fix those things too. So speaking of the can't side cardiac, did you want to discuss short rows? Yeah, at all? absolutely. And okay. first of all, explain why that would help if people want to add some short rows. And let's back up to say some of our be beginner knitters may not understand that term. And okay. the short rows to me are simply a row that you're not knitting all the way across. You've cut it short yeah. and you're just turning around and knitting or purling back the other way. So a short row is simply that. It's not a full length row. You're yeah, just so I have it. this lovely piece of trash right here because I was cleaning earlier. So let's say I've got my knitted row. Okay. And if I'm doing a short row, I'm going to knit to like, say my front raglan marker right here. I'm going to wrap and turn, which is something you can learn or you can do a different type of short row. I'm going to turn around and go back to my other raglan marker, wrap and turn, go back again, not quite past that one, maybe a little bit before it, wrap and turn. And what that does is it creates this nice, can right. you see, kind of curve upper lump of fabric. And when you do that on a back neck, whether it's a pullover or a cardigan, that extra fabric kind of makes it rise. It'll make your neck sit a little nicer mm -hmm. and it'll kind of hug the shoulders better. Right, so, so it doesn't end up going like this and going down in the back. Right, right, and, and that's like with my Icelandic sweaters, I like to throw a bunch of short rows in because it does, it just, it hugs the back neck better. So, um, and if you want to do them and they're not in the pattern, I would say come around to um, just a little bit past your first raglan marker after you're a couple rows in and you can just work one without doing any increases at all. And that will just add this nice little kind of sliver of fabric that will so kind how of How many rise. times would you go back and forth if someone wanted to add that? Would they just go back and forth doing that maybe four times? Uh, yeah, honestly, four times would be a good number. Um, and I would say you don't even have to work it into your raglan shaping. Since this is a cardigan, I would work it into the ribbing when you're doing the edge ribbing. Later. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and as you're doing it, you're continuing to work in the rib. So like K2, P2, K2, P2, K1, wrap and turn. Yeah. P2, K2, P2, K2, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> One, wrap and turn, you know, and do that, but do it like right up here, okay? And don't bring it down too far, but you want it just a little bit where it's past your neck. And you could even. Your collarbone. 
Right. Yeah, you could even try the sweater on without the edging and put little safety pins in and say like, this is a good spot for a wrap and turn and then mark it equally on both sides and then another one further up. This is a good spot for a wrap and turn and then maybe one more set that's up near the back neck. And instead of like worrying about numbers, you could just knit to those safety pins that are evenly or equi right. equidistantly spaced. Really? I hope that wasn't too confusing. No, I get it. I get it. I don't know that I'm going to do it, but I get it. But if people yeah. have questions, post in the Ravelry group and yeah. we'll tag Alicia and she'll be like, please tag me if you, if you need my attention. Um, Thank you so much. That's so nice of you to be willing to yeah. be like, sort this out for me. <laughs> tag me because um, if you just are talking about me, it won't let me know. Um, and sometimes like my inbox can get a little overloaded. Like I typically have anywhere from 20 to 30 messages and questions in my inbox on a given day. Right. So if you put my name in the, in the brackets, uh, yeah. in the brackets and then, you know, person in parentheses, yeah. it will shoot me a little message saying, Hey, you've been mentioned, come over to this thread. And I can be like, Oh, yay. I'll come over here. And then I can well, discuss it. And if whatever. people if people post in the thread in the Pearl Together Ravelry group, and I see that you haven't been, well, Ravelry calls it ear burning because yeah. that, back when yeah. Ravelry first started in 2007 ish, yeah, that's what it was called then. We call it tagging now, but it's the same same. But if, yeah, if yeah. people, if I can't answer the question, I will mess. I will ear burn you just to make sure yeah. you've seen it. But keep in mind that Alicia has, you know. A lot going on. So be patient. She will get to us. If I can't answer and we ear burn you, it's because I don't get it either. <laughs> <laughs> and, or I don't understand the question. And yeah, but we'll try not yeah. to abuse that generosity. So I appreciate that. Oh, well, I'm excited about it. And I'm excited to like get to know a new group of people. Like I just, I love meeting new people and hearing people's stories and the colors they choose and the modifications they make. Like it's all just really fun. It's really fun. It is totally fun. And it's the best group of, it's the best demographic, really. I know. I love my group. Well, I mean, just knitters in general are the best. Oh, they are. Yeah, that's what I mean. So They totally are. It's like, I would say knitters in general are just so kind and helpful and intelligent. Very yeah. intelligent. We want to see pictures. So, too. We, mm -hmm. I mean, if, of your work. Show us cast on. Show us all your stuff. Mm -hmm. So, head on over to the Ravelry group. We have a thread started. And Alicia, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been fun. I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody's pieces and getting to know everyone. Thanks. See ya. Bye.